Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. Hey, David Thomas. Hey, Sissy Goff. So excited we're back talking more about an intentional summer. And aren't we ready for the summer? Yes, we are. And I don't even think I can say what we're talking about this week. Like, get it out of my mouth. We're talking about an intentional technological summer. (laughs) That was a lot. You did great. That is a lot. So I'd love to hear, David, thinking about that. And since we talk so much about practices, is there a practice you've been using lately to help you with your own limits on technology? Mm, That's a great one. I would say... I am trying to think about using it more just for the purposes of learning, Mm. not consumption. Mm, So that's that's been my challenge lately. Like, I'm late to every party, but I was (laughs) late to the party of audiobooks, and I've Uh, loved it. I just finished my first audiobook, and thinking about using technology for listening to podcasts while I'm making breakfast, those kinds of things. So I'm really focusing in in that direction, trying to limit it for consumption, focus in on it for learning. What about you? That's good. Oh, I think I have been convicted because as we're recording this, has we're actually the launch week for Brave. And so I have had to be on my phone so much more than ever because of social media. And so I'm having to be really purposeful about consciously flipping my phone over face down and putting it away from me because it's just in lieu of anything else sometimes. I just find myself picking it up and scrolling through things. And I don't mean to be, I don't even think I want to look at something, but I just find myself doing it. So I'm literally flipping it over and scooting it farther from me because that's kind of the only way I can stop myself sometimes. Good for you. Yeah, well, it helps for sure. So thinking about the summer, I think that is a time we always hear parents say, what do we do in the summer? How do we put limits? Because they are home, obviously. And this summer, we don't know totally what it's going to look like in terms of they're probably going to be home more than they would in a normal summer. And so thinking about that, there are a few things we were thinking we'd love just to remind you of as the summer starts. And one is that kids really do still need limits in the summer, in a hopefully moving out of the pandemic summer, still they need limits. And I came across, which a lot of you all may have read this, but I found this really fascinating study. It talked about the rise of smartphone technology, and it was put out by the University of Michigan. And they did this great study about emotion and confidence, and that from 1990 to 2012, confidence, self-esteem, life satisfaction, and happiness were gradually rising. We hit 2012, which was the year smartphone ownership in the United States reached the 50% mark, and it started declining, Mm. which is not a surprise, I think, to any of us. And it found that adolescent psychological well-being decreased the more hours a week they spent on screens, which, again, is not a huge surprise. But there was a piece of good news that I thought was really fascinating, that teenagers who get a small amount of exposure between one and five hours per week. Now, y'all hear that. It's one to five hours, not per day, but per week, are happier than kids who get no screen time at all. Interesting. I know. I thought that was fascinating, too. That's good news. But the least happy kids are those who use screens for 20 hours or more a week. Mm. And what we would know, too, the happiest kids are those who have more face-to-face interaction than they do with screen interaction. And with Zoom, with all the things that we've been in the midst of, I think we really want to pay attention to that this summer because depending on where you are, depending on what the ordinances are for your area, we just still need to be making sure that kids are safely having a chance to connect. And let me tell you, so I have this grid 
and we might could even put a link to it because I think it's fascinating about the amount of happiness and time kids spent on certain activities. So the highest happiness, what would you guess the highest degree of happiness was? So like what we're doing to make us happy? Yes, what kids are doing that make them the happiest. Spending time on technology. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's the inverse, which is so cool. The happiest kids are the ones, I was really unhappy as a kid, evidently, because it's the ones who are exercising or participating in sports. Fantastic. That's top. Then in-person social interaction. Wow. Then religious services. Then print media and then homework. Homework is almost baseline. We're at zero. And then working is actually baseline. So not unhappiness or not happiness. Some days we all feel that. Then we start to decline. Reading news online goes down a little further. TV, negative 0.05 is video chat. So like Zoom is actually decreasing happiness. Texting is below that. Then social media, then computer games, and then just being on the internet in general. So it's just fascinating. And it's what we would know. And the great news in that is kids can get outside and they can exercise and they can participate, hopefully safely distanced in some sports right now. So we just want to be aware of helping them find their way to places that are going to elevate their confidence, elevate their self-esteem and bring happiness. And we want to be aware that there is a relationship between screens and that. And I think even this podcast could be great to go back and listen to with your kids and If you're listening, kids, we're sorry, (laughs) but we have to give you the hard data to say what really is going to bring, because we're for you. We want you to feel confident. We want you to have good self-esteem. And so all of those things contribute to it. And you all know this, the American Academy of Pediatrics says under two hours per day for kids, unless they're under the age of two, and you all know how much it says on screens, how much time they're supposed to have zero hours per day under the age of two. Also, we would encourage you to be aware of your own technology use, because as David says all the time, and I love the statement, kids learn more from observation than information, and even in terms of what they watch with technology. So if you need to set screen time limits for yourself, if you need to flip it over, put it away, talk with them about using it like David talked about more for learning than for just consumption, that we want to be aware of all of those things in terms of technology. And David, what else can they do that can be helpful? Those of you who've heard us talk on technology at any point know that we believe strongly in contracts and we would encourage you to, even if you have a contract in place, revisit or revise that contract for summer because as Sissy just said, there are going to be more hours available. They aren't in school 35 to 40 hours a week. But as you do... We'd encourage you to take a look at Menno has a great family media agreement that could serve as a guide in this process. As he mentioned, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations, they have a family media calculator that allows you, again, thinking about kids' overall health, how to set limits and amounts that are in keeping with where kids are developmentally. And we just, again, believe so strongly in contracts because... One, it's the way the world works. Like (laughs) I have a contract with AT&T for my cell phone and one with the mortgage company and one with my employer and could even be great to show kids one of your contracts as you even talk about that. So it doesn't sound like a lecture, but just that visual reminder, which is a great lead in into another reason we think it's important. It's a visual tool and kids are visual and experiential learners. So it's a great match there. I love that Sissy started this episode with sharing those statistics and that grid. And I think it could even be great to put a couple of those statistics at the top of your contract as a reminder of, again, this is not opinion. These are facts. And so we want to be working with this new data to inform kind of the terms of our contract. We'd also remind you with the contracts, make sure it's clear concrete and concise. Those are three important words to go back to. We don't want a lot of language and verbiage. Kids are going to get lost in that. But so much of that clear, concise language really could be a tool for diminishing battle. So we're not going back and forth when it's just really clear about when they can use, when they can't. And lastly, we would throw out the idea of with creating the contracts in the summer, as kids are going to be wanting more time and there is more time, to maybe consider 
creating a list of some extra jobs that they could do to earn some extra media yeah, time, but like not that. just giving that over. And even if it's not extra jobs, extra outdoor time, extra service time, extra, there's so many ways you could fill in the blank with that, but that they're earning the opportunity with some of the good stuff that Sissy just mentioned that we know is going to be a part of contributing to happiness as part of earning that extra time. What else would you say? Well, two things that will contribute to your happiness. <laughs> One is I would say stay out of the power struggles with them. And there are great tools now, and we are not sponsored by these folks, so we really can say from a very objective perspective, Circle is a really fabulous tool for the life of your family where you can set limits for each of your kids. You can set bedtime, and then you don't have to get in that back and forth power struggle of give me your tablet or give me your phone, and they're yelling at you, and then you end up with a consequence. So you just turn them off. That can be really helpful. And then Bark is an app that we love to that can monitor and regulate what kids are doing online. So that would be something that we think would contribute to your happiness. And then also just as simple as it sounds, give yourself grace in this because you all, I mean, we have talked so much about the shame that we're hearing daily right now from parents in our office and the the fact that they feel like a failure. And I think technology is one of the biggest sources of that. And so set up the things, have the conversations, and then give yourself grace if there's a day that they end up on screens more than they have to be, or you're taking a family vacation. And obviously when they're in the car or you're on a plane or you need to do certain things to let them have more technology, don't let the rules become binding for you, where you can't even enjoy the process of what you're doing as a family because you get so locked into what your goal is in terms of screen time. So so have these as guidelines, but think loosely and give yourself grace when it goes out the window at times, because it will. And that's helpful to have that as an expectation. And I'd love for us to talk about, you know, I think we do every week, just some intentional practices we can think of And so in light of that, in light of limits, the first one I would say is love for y'all as a family to sit down and talk before the summer comes, to come up with an agreement with each of your kids as to time. And it can be a great way to teach the art of compromise to kids. And so even before you sit down, there are a couple of questions I would say to ask them and let them even write about it, write some notes down before y'all come back together. So some questions are, what would they like in terms of technology use this summer? What do they think is fair is a second one. So let them say what they want in terms of time allowance. And I don't know if you feel like this, but when I work on compromising with families in my office, it's so fun because so often kids will be more restrictive on themselves than I would ever imagine. Now, some kids aren't, but it's fun to hear the ones that are. So Start there. Let them say exactly what they feel like is fair. What would they like? And then the third question to David's point of what would they like to do to earn extra technology time is a third question. So think about coming in with those questions already answered, and maybe you answer for yourself too, and then create one of those contracts David talked about together with what screen time is going to look like. And then also together make a list, and you could call it things more fun than screens (laughs) and come up with a list together that you're going to put in a visual place over the summer. And so if they've already passed their time allotment for the day, you can say, go check the board and they know to go run and look and you can put, you know, family bike rides, learn to cook. We have in a lot of different places and we'll put up during the summer too, some great movie recommendations for your family to watch with kids with different ages Common Sense Media does that as well. So have a a summer movie list of things they can watch too, but you want other alternatives. And I love the idea of things more fun than screens. Just a reminder about what really does create happiness. David, what would you add as a second practice? I would say a second practice is to have a family check-in around screen time. I love that Apple sends a reminder each week, and I think you can have it send it to you a little more often than once a week as a point of reference for, and I think all of us have had a moment where we've been shocked or surprised by the amount of time we've spent yes. on a screen or- Convicted, let's at, use that word. Exactly, or engaged with a certain platform. And so as a family, check in and ask some good questions. Like when everybody gets their report, what surprised you this week? Did you do more or less of something? If less, how did you fill that time instead? 
And then within using technology in different ways, ask some questions that allow kids to think about how they're using it advantageously. Like, what shows are you enjoying? What characters do you identify within those shows? You know, if they're on social media, if you have kids who are old enough for a platform, who are you following that inspires you to be a better version of yourself? These kinds of questions that allow kids to think about using media for their benefit and, again, not just for consumption. What else would you add to the list? Well, we talk about this a lot, but technology Sabbaths, I think to take a week that you can take a technology Sabbath together. Now, that may sound like a really tall order, but it could be just transformational in the life of your family. And obviously, you are going to need to check things for work or have your phone near sometimes for emergency purposes. But other than that, that you all make a commitment to each other that you're going to take a week off. And we would encourage you to have a meeting pre the week off and post the week off and ask some questions like, how does each person in the family feel about going without technology for a week? And answer honestly yourself, have a conversation. What do you think you'll miss the most? And let them talk about it. And and let me say too, don't correct them or don't explain to them why they should be glad they're taking a week off. Just let it be a conversation where everybody answers honestly. And then at the end of the week, go back to what did each of you really miss about it? What did you learn about technology's impact on you? And what did you learn about yourself? And I'm going to say all those questions again, just in case you didn't have a piece of paper when we were talking about at the beginning. So at the beginning, how do you feel about going without it? What do you think you'll miss the most? And then at the end, what did each of you really miss about it? What did you learn about technology's impact on you? And what did you learn about yourself? And our guess is there will be a lot that all of you will learn about yourselves and about your family. And we just are excited for you to have time that is unplugged this summer and to get to really invest in each other. And and summer gives us an opportunity to do that with a sense of play and adventure that we don't have during the year often. And so we're excited for you to lean into that and learn more about each other and how you can love each other in an intentional non-technological summer. I got it out. That was great. (laughs) You did great. We're cheering you on, you guys. Thank you always for inviting us into your homes and your AirPods and your cars and all those things. We love getting to be with you guys. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family, which shows kids love and values parents' trust. Check them out at podcast.gomino.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.